Hello and welcome back. In today's video, I'm overclocking the Intel Xeon W5 3435X all the way up to 5.2 gigahertz using the Asus Pro WSW790E Sage SE motherboard and EK Pro custom loop water cooling. We'll do that by manually adjusting the P core turbo ratios. We'll also set some per core ratio limits. And of course, we'll manually set our voltages. Also, I'll have a quick look at how Sapphire Rapids overclocking works in general. But first, let's start off with the hardware. All right, we have a lot to cover, so let's get started. The Intel Xeon W5 3435X is part of Intel's fourth generation Xeon scalable processor lineup, and it was previously known as Sapphire Rapids 64L and 112L. Sapphire Rapids is the successor to, well, a variety of architectures. Enthusiasts like myself can think of the Sapphire Rapids W790 platform as the successor of the overclockable Cascade Lake X and locked Cascade Lake W processors. But perhaps the real spiritual predecessor of the unlocked Xeon W2400 and W3400 series is the overclockable 28-core Xeon W3175X launched in 2018. Intel spoke at length about Sapphire Rapids in their 2021 Architecture Day. I'm not going to cover any of those architecture details in this video, uh, but suffice to say that there are some significant improvements compared to Ice Lake, Cooper Lake, and Cascade Lake. The most significant improvements are the Intel 7 process technology and up to 56 Golden Cove P cores. That makes Alder Lake the equivalent on mainstream desktop. It also features PCIe 5.0, DDR5 EEC RDIMM support, and Intel's third generation deep learning boost technology. Lastly, Sapphire Rapids transitions from a single monolithic die design to a multi tile design for increased scalability. Well, sort of. Only the Xeon W3400 series uses the multi-tile die design, whereas the Xeon W2400 segment still features a monolithic die. And that's not where the difference between the W2400 and W3400 series ends. While the W3400 series goes up to 56 P cores, the W2400 only goes up to 24 P cores. The W3400 series supports 8-channel memory, whereas the W2400 series only supports 4-channel memory. The W3400 series also supports 112 PCIe 5.0 lanes, whereas the W2400 series only supports 64 lanes. Intel further segments the Sapphire Rapid CPUs according the Xeon W3, W5, W7 and W9 brands. That is similar to how we have Core i3 to Core i9 on the mainstream desktop. Xeon W9 is reserved exclusively for the W3400 series, and you can only find Xeon W3 processors in the Xeon W2400 product line. Across all Sapphire Rapids workstation products, eight overclockable SKUs are split evenly between the W2400 and W3400 segments. We'll get back to how overclocking is enabled later in this video. The Xeon W5 3435X has 16 P cores with 32 threads. The base frequency is 3.1 GHz, the Turbo Boost 2.0 frequency is 4.5 GHz, and the Turbo Boost Max 3.0 boost frequency is 4.7 GHz. The maximum boost frequency gradually decreases from 4.7 GHz for up to two active cores to 3.7 GHz when all cores are active. The base TDP is 270 Watt and the Turbo TDP is 324 Watt. The TJ Max is 98 degrees Celsius. In this video, we will cover four different overclocking strategies. First, we rely on ASUS MCE and ASUS memory presets. Second, we use the ASUS water-cooled OC preset. Third, we try a static manual overclock. Lastly, we go for a dynamic manual overclock. However, before we jump into the overclocking, let's first have a look at the hardware and the benchmarks that we'll be using in this guide. The system we're overclocking today consists of the following hardware. The Easy Fan Controller Scatterbencher Edition, or EFCSB, is the result of a collaboration between Scatterbencher and Elmore Labs. I already 
explained how I use the EFC and the EFCSB in different videos on this channel. By connecting the EFCSB to the EVC2 device, I monitor the ambient temperature, water temperature, and fan duty cycle. I include the measurements in my Prime95 stability test results. I also use the Elmo Labs EFCSB to map the radiator fan curve to the water temperature. Without going into too many details, I've attached an external temperature sensor from the water in the loop to the EFCSB. Then I use the low high setting to map the fan curve from 25 to 40 degrees water temperature. I use this configuration for all overclocking strategies. The main takeaway from this configuration is that it gives us a good indication whether or not our cooling solution is saturated. We use Windows 11 and the following benchmark applications to measure performance and ensure system stability. Before we start overclocking, of course, we have to check the performance at default settings. Please note that out of the box, this Pro WS-W790E Sage SE motherboard has the Turbo Boost power limits unlocked. So if we want to check the performance of this CPU at default settings, we first have to go into the BIOS and go to the AI Tweaker menu, set Asus Multicore Enhancement to Disabled and Force All Limits, then save and exit the BIOS. The default Turbo Boost 2.0 parameters for the Xeon W53435X are as follows. Here's the benchmark performance at stock. Here are the 3D Mark CPU profile scores at stock. When running Prime95, small FFTs with AVX enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 3262 MHz with 0.884 volts. The average CPU temperature is 43 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.9 and 30.5 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 269.9 watts. When running Prime95, small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 3,553 MHz with 0.918 volts. The average CPU temperature is 45 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 27.4 and 30.7 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 269.6 watts. Now let us try our first overclocking strategy. But before that, make sure to locate the clear CMOS button. Pressing the clear CMOS button will reset all your BIOS settings to default, which is helpful if you want to start your BIOS configuration from scratch. However, it does not delete any of the BIOS profiles previously saved. In our first overclocking strategy, we will make use of ASUS multi-core enhancement to unleash the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits, and we'll also do some memory overclocking using the ASUS memory presets. Turbo Boost 2.0 allows the processor to run faster than the base specification if the processor is within the thermal, current, and power limits. The ultimate advantage is, of course, that you can have better single-threaded as well as multi-threaded performance. The Turbo Boost algorithm works according a proprietary EWMA formula. That stands for Exponentially Weight Moving Average. There are three parameters to consider. PL1, PL2, and Tau. Of course, Turbo Boost 2.0 is available on Sapphire Rapids as it's the primary driver of performance on top of the base specifications. An easy ASUS multi-core enhancement option on ASUS motherboards allows you to unleash the Turbo Boost power limits. Set the option to enable to remove all limits and enjoy maximum performance. Adjusting the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits is, strictly speaking, not considered overclocking. And that's because we don't change any of the voltage, frequency, or thermal parameters. Intel provides the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits as a guidance to system integrators or motherboard makers, just to make sure that the CPU can run at base specification. However, as we all know, Better motherboard designs or thermal solutions or chassis designs can enable peak performance for longer. ASUS Memory Presets is an ASUS overclocking technology that allows you to very quickly fine tune a certain memory IC. Essentially, the presets contain a set of primary and sometimes even secondary timings for specific ICs. It will also sometimes adjust the memory voltage. The technology was first introduced in 2012 on Z77 and has been available on select ASUS motherboards ever since. 
the memory profiles available differ from platform to platform. Four memory profiles are available on the Asus Pro WS W790E Sage SE motherboard, two each for Hynix and Micron. Since our memory can overclock pretty well, we use the profile for Hynix DDR5 6800 memory. However, we manually set the memory frequency to DDR5 6600 since it couldn't run 6800 on this CPU. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits. Set DRAM Frequency to DDR5-6600. Enter the DRAM Timing Control submenu. Enter the Memory Presets submenu. Select Load Hynix 6800 1.4V 8x16GB Single Rank. Select Yes. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. After unleashing the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits and overclocking the system memory, the performance barely improves except in highly memory sensitive workloads, which benefit from overclocking the memory from DDR5 4800 to DDR5 6600. We see the highest performance improvement of plus 11.03% in Y Cruncher. We don't see a more significant impact from unleashing the Turbo Boost power limits because we're primarily frequency limited. The standard frequency for an all-core workload is only 3.7 GHz, so the frequency won't boost beyond that despite unleashing the power limits. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 3386 MHz with 0.896 V. The average CPU temperature is 47 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.8 and 31.4 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 342.4 watts. When running Prime95, small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 3537 MHz with 0.915 volts. The average CPU temperature is 46 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.9 and 31.1 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 310.6 watts. In our second overclocking strategy, we will make use of the ASUS water-cooled OC profile that's embedded in the ASUS motherboard BIOS. However, using the profile is not as straightforward as it was with the Xeon W7-2495X, which I've overclocked in Scatterventure number 59. So in order to sufficiently explain how this water-cooled profile works, I want to introduce you to three Intel overclocking technologies, Turbo Boost 2.0, Turbo Boost Max 3.0, and Intel Adaptive Voltage. We all know the Turbo Boost 2.0 technology from the way that it can help us unleash the maximum power limits of our CPU. But Intel Turbo Boost 2.0 is also important because it allows us to specify which ratio can be used when a certain number of cores are active. Intel provides eight registers to configure the Turbo Boost 2.0 ratios. On mainstream platforms, where the top SKU has no more than eight P cores, these registers are configured from one active P core to eight active P cores. However, on platforms with core counts beyond eight cores, we can configure each register by target Turbo Boost ratio and number of active cores. For example, the standard and ASUS water-cooled OC preset Turbo Boost ratio configuration of the Xeon W5-3435X is as follows. Note that by core usage doesn't mean that we're overclocking specific cores. When we're configuring an overclock using the by core usage method, it means that we're setting an overclock for when a number of cores are active. Which cores are active during a certain workload is still entirely up to the CPU. In 2016, Intel introduced a technology called Turbo Boost Max 3.0 technology. And while it carries the same name as Turbo Boost 2.0, it's not really an iteration or a successor to the Turbo Boost 2.0. Intel Turbo Boost Max 3.0 aims to exploit the natural variance in core quality within a certain CPU. Intel identifies the best cores inside your CPU and calls those the favored cores. These favored cores are important for two reasons. 
First, Intel allows for additional frequency boost of the favored cores. On the Sapphire Rapids Xeon W53435X, there are four favored P cores. Two can boost to 4.6 GHz and two can boost to 4.7 GHz. The rest of the non-favored cores are limited to 4.5 GHz. Second, the operating system will automatically assign the most demanding workloads to these favored cores, ensuring potentially higher performance. Just like any previous Intel architecture, there are two ways to configure your CPU core voltage, override mode and adaptive mode. Override mode specifies a single static voltage across all ratios. It is mainly used for extreme overclocking, where stability at high frequencies is the only consideration. Adaptive mode is the standard mode of operation. In adaptive mode, the CPU relies on the factory fused voltage frequency curves to set the appropriate voltage for a given ratio. When configuring an adaptive voltage, it is mapped against the OC ratio, the highest configured ratio. We'll get back to that in a minute. Since Sapphire Rapids uses Fiverr, the only way that we can control the CPU core voltage is by programming the PCU using the BIOS or specialized tools like XTU. We can specify a voltage offset for override and adaptive modes. Of course, this doesn't make much sense for override mode. If you set 1.15 volt with a plus 50 millivolt offset, you might as well set 1.2 volt, but it can be helpful in adaptive mode as you can offset the entire VF curve by up to 500 millivolt in both directions. On Sapphire Rapids, you can control both the override voltage and the adaptive voltage on a global and a per core level. To better understand how adaptive voltage mode works, let's have a look at how it works when we look at one specific core. When we set an adaptive voltage for a core, this voltage is mapped against the OC ratio. The OC ratio is the highest ratio configured for the CPU across all settings and cores. When you leave everything at default, the OC ratio is determined by the default maximum turbo ratio. In the case of the W53435X, that ratio would be 47X because of the Turbo Boost Max 3.0. The OC ratio equals the highest configured ratio if you overclock. Specific rules govern what voltage can be programmed. The voltage set for a given ratio n must be higher than or equal to the voltage set for ratio n minus 1. Suppose our 3435X runs 47X at 1.2 volt. In that case, setting the adaptive voltage mapped to 47X lower than 1.2 volt is pointless. 47X always runs at 1.2 volt or higher. Usually, biases may allow you to configure lower values. However, the CPU's internal mechanisms will override your configuration if it doesn't follow the rules. The adaptive voltage configured for any ratio below the maximum default turbo ratio will be ignored. Take the same example of the 3435X specified to run 47X at 1.2 volt. If you try to configure all cores to 45X and set 1.1 volt, the CPU will ignore this because it has its own factory fused target voltage for all ratios up to 47X and will use this voltage. You can only change the voltage of the OC ratio, which as mentioned before, on the 3435X is 47X and up. For ratios between the OC ratio and the next highest factory fused VF point, the voltage is interpolated between the set adaptive voltage and the factory fused voltage. Returning to our example of a 3435X specified to run 47X at 1.2 volt. Let's say we manually configure the OC ratio to be 52X at 1.35 volt. The target voltage for ratios 51X, 50X, 49X and 48X will now be interpolated between 1.2 volt and 1.35 volt. As I mentioned, we can do this for every core individually. And while that might seem reasonable for this 16 core CPU, imagine if you'd have to go through this with a 56 core Xeon processor. That's a lot of work. Fortunately, there's also another way that we can configure the CPU core voltage, and that's what a global adaptive voltage. When we set a global adaptive voltage, it maps this voltage to the OC ratio for each core in our CPU. So if our OC ratio is 52X and the global adaptive voltage is 1.35 volt, 
then every core in our CPU has a voltage frequency curve that goes up to 52x at 1.35 volt. We can also configure a per core ratio limit. Counterintuitively, this ratio doesn't act as a core specific OC ratio, but as a means to limit what parts of the VF curve can be used. Let's use that same example of the 52x at 1.35 volt. If we set the per core ratio limit to 51x, the CPU core will boost up to 5.1 gigahertz at a voltage interpolated between 52x at 1.35 volt and 48x at 1.25 volt. While we only recently saw the addition of per core ratio control on mainstream desktop since I think Rocket Lake, this feature has been around on high-end desktop for a very long time. It was first introduced on Broadwell E in 2016. Using the per core ratio control and per core voltage control, we can essentially control the upper end of the VF curve for every of our CPU cores. The general rules for adaptive voltage, as I just explained to you, still apply, but this feature is still helpful in several ways. First, it allows users to overclock each core individually and find its maximum stable frequency. Second, it allows users to set an aggressive by core usage overclock while constraining the worst cores. Since each core has an independent fiber regulated power rail, it's possible to fine tune each core to its maximum capability. The water cooled OC preset is a great addition to the Asus W790 motherboards. Essentially, it allows us to get a lot more performance with essentially the click of a single button. The OC preset primarily improves the all core performance by drastically increasing the Turbo Boost 2.0 ratios. Furthermore, the preset also adjusts the per core ratio limit. On this Xeon W5 3435X, for example, by enabling the preset, the all core frequency increases by almost 1 GHz from 3.7 GHz to 4.6 GHz. In addition, it increases the maximum CPU ratio for all cores by plus 1, except for the two super favored cores. As a result, all cores can now boost to 4.6 GHz and 4 cores can boost to 4.7 GHz. While the OC preset aims to do this without adjusting any of the CPU core voltages, it inadvertently does so for a bizarre reason. Remember what I said about the Turbo Boost 2.0 and Turbo Boost Max 3.0 ratio configuration? Two cores are specified to run up to 4.7 GHz, two cores can run up to 4.6 GHz, and the rest of the 12 cores can only run up to 4.5 GHz. The expectation is that Intel has specified for each core, a factory fused specific voltage for its maximum ratio. When you increase the ratio without adjusting the adaptive voltage, it would use the voltage for its highest VF point. Strangely enough, that's not the case for the 12 non-favored cores. As you can see from this chart, each of the 12 non-favored cores has a factory fused VF point for 4.7 gigahertz or 47X and that point is at 1.37 volt. That's really high. In practical terms, as we learn from the adaptive voltage explanation, that means it's not possible to control the adaptive voltage for any of the non-favored cores below 4.7 gigahertz. Or put differently, every non-favored core will run at an increased voltage when boosting to 4.6 gigahertz. That will significantly impact our overclocking process when we try to manually set our Intel adaptive voltage later in this video. For now, it suffices to say that the water-cooled OC preset inadvertently increases the core voltage when all cores are active from about 1.12 volt to 1.24 volt. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set ACES multi-core enhancement to enable to remove all limits. Set CPU core ratio to water-cooled OC preset. Set DRAM frequency to DDR5-6600. Enter the DRAM timing control submenu. Enter the memory presets submenu. Select load Hynix 6800 1.4V 8x16GB single rack. Select yes. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. By enabling the water-cooled OC preset, we significantly increase the all-core frequency. 
that greatly improves performance as we also unleash the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits. We see a maximum performance improvement of plus 32.96% in CPU profile 16 threads. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4537 MHz with 1.226 volts. The average CPU temperature is 97 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 27.8 and 36 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 613 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4580 MHz with 1.226 volts. The average CPU temperature is 85 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 27.3 and 34.1 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 495.7 watts. In our third overclocking strategy, we will perform a manual fixed overclock. Now, I am not known for advocating in favor of an overclock where we use one ratio across all the cores with one specific voltage. And that's primarily because on mainstream CPUs, you tend to lose out on a lot of performance in single or lightly threaded workloads. But for Sapphire Rapids, I decide to give this approach another shot. Before we start manually overclocking, however, let's first have a look at the Sapphire Rapids clocking and voltage topology, as understanding those two will help us better understand how we can set a manual fixed overclock. The clocking of a standard Sapphire Rapids platform slightly differs from what we're used to with mainstream platforms. The supported clocking topology relies on a 25 MHz crystal or crystal oscillator input to an external CK440Q clock generator. The external clock generator generates multiple 100 or 25 MHz clock sources. These sources can be used in a variety of ways. The platform supports multiple clocking topologies, balanced and unbalanced. The specific implementation depends on your choice of motherboard. Ideally, we would isolate the CPU BCLK from any PCIe reference clocks. However, it seems that this unbalanced architecture is currently not working very well. So you'll likely see all motherboards adopting a balanced clocking architecture. That means if you increase the CPU BCLK, you also increase the CPU PCIe clock frequency. The 100 MHz CPU BCLK is then multiplied with specific ratios for each of the different parts in the CPU. Each P-Core can run at its independent frequency. The maximum CPU ratio is 120x, however the maximum all-core ratio is limited to 52x on multi-tile die CPUs. I'll get back to that in a minute. The mesh PLL ties together the last level cache, cache box and seemingly also the memory controller. It can run an independent frequency from the P-Cores. On monolithic dies of the W2400 processors, the mesh ratio is limited to 80x. However, on the multi-tile dies of the W3400 processors, the mesh ratio is limited to 27x. The memory frequency is also driven by the CPU BCLK and multiplied by a memory ratio. Unlike on mainstream desktop, the memory frequency is not tied to the memory controller frequency. The memory ratio goes up to 88x or a frequency of up to DDR5-8800. There are a couple of noteworthy oddities with CPU core overclocking on Sapphire Rapids. While the per core maximum ratio is 120x, the Turbo Boost 2.0 ratio limit for one active core is 117x. On multi-tile die Sapphire Rapids variants, the Turbo Boost 2.0 all-core maximum allowed CPU ratio is 52x. Effectively, you must increase the BCLK frequency with the 52x maximum ratio to break all core world records. This all core ratio limit is not present on the monolithic die variants. The CPU has similar FLLLC issues as on early Alder Lake platforms. In short, a bug appears to allow a ratio to be programmed to the CPU PLL even though the actual effective frequency is lower. That may cause you to see reported frequency much higher than reasonable. However, the CPU performance in benchmark applications isn't affected. So the benchmark performance reflects the real effective frequency. Building on the previous point, specific CPU cores appear to have different points at which the FLL bug occurs. So for record chasing attempts, you may try to find the cores in your CPU 
with the highest FLL range and only use those for benchmarking. Sapphire Rapids uses a combination of fully integrated voltage regulators or fivers and motherboard voltage regulators or MBVRs. In total, there are eight MBVRs providing power towards the Intel CPU, and then the fibers inside the CPU provide or distribute the power to all the different parts inside your core. As an end user, we can control some of the voltages that are regulated by the fibers. VCCN is the primary power source for the CPU. It provides the input power for the fiber, which in turn provides power to each P core individually and the combined mesh and last level cache. The default voltage is 1.8 volt. Through Intel's overclocking toolkit, we have access to up to 57 power domains. VCC Core N provides the voltage to up to 56 individual P cores and VCC Mesh provides the voltage to the mesh and last level cache. VCC FA EHV provides the input power for the PCIe 5.0 UPI IO and all other fiber power domains. The default voltage is 1.0 volt. Through Intel's overclocking toolkit, we have access to two power domains. VCC CFN provides the power for the on die coherent fabric, which provides the means of communication between the various components inside the die or tile. Each module on the die, whether the core, memory controller, IO, or accelerator, contains an agent providing access to the coherent fabric. The default voltage is 0.7 volt. VCC MDFI provides the power for the multi-die fabric interconnect, which extends the coherent fabric across multiple dies. The default voltage is 0.5 volt. VCC DHV provides the power source for the DDR5 memory controllers. These voltages are not shared with the DDR5 memory. The default voltage is 1.1 volt. Through Intel's overclocking toolkit, we have access to two power domains. VCC DDRD, possibly the memory controller core voltage, which defaults at 0.7 volt, and VCC DDRA, possibly the memory controller side IO voltage, which defaults at 0.9 volt. Intel first introduced AVX negative ratio offset on Broadwell E in 2016. Successive generations of this technology uh, enabled negative ratio offsets for AVX2 and AVX512. And with Sapphire Rapids, we have something new, TMUL offset. TMUL stands for Tile Matrix Multiply and is an Intel Advanced Matrix Extension or AMX technology component. It is designed to accelerate AI and deep learning workloads. These ratio offsets help achieve maximum performance for SSE, AVX, and AMX workloads. Since Skylake, Intel has implemented a more elegant frequency license-based approach. The four frequency levels are L0, L1, L2, and L3. Each level is associated with a particular instruction, ranging from the lightest to the heaviest. Each level can also be associated with one specific ratio offset. As a rule, the ratio offset configured for a given frequency license must be equal to or higher than the preceding frequency license. Since Icelake, the negative ratio offset is applied on a per core basis. That means that the maximum ratio for an AVX or an AVX512 or a TMO workload will be the combination of the per core ratio limit minus any of the negative ratio offsets. The regular rules for the Turbo Boost 2.0 also still apply. In this strategy, we're pursuing a manual fixed overclock, and that means one ratio for all the cores and one voltage for all the cores. In this kind of an overclock, the main limitation will be our worst case stress test scenario. And for this CPU or for this scatterbencher gu guide, that will be Prime 95 with AVX2 enabled, small FFTs. That may surprise some of you as we'd expect the AVX512 workload to be heavier. But as we demonstrated in the Xeon W72495X Scatterventure Guide, AVX2 produces a higher CPU package power with a higher CPU temperature. The main limiting factor for the frequency isn't really the CPU's frequency capability, but the maximum temperature or the maximum operating temperature of this CPU. For the Xeon W53435X, the maximum operating temperature is 98 degrees Celsius, 
and we already reached that temperature when we simply used the water-cooled OC preset. As you know, power scales exponentially with operating voltage. For example, a 10% increase in voltage on this CPU increases power consumption by about 21%. Ultimately, the operating voltage is the main limiting factor for our maximum frequency. I found that for this CPU, the maximum voltage was around 1.21 volt. That was sufficient to set an all core frequency of 4.9 gigahertz up 200 megahertz from when two cores are active and 1.2 gigahertz higher than stock when all 16 cores are active. Side note, I mistakenly implied in the previous Scatterbencher Sapphire Rapids guide that the maximum temperature is the same for each SKU. However, the maximum allowed temperature differs from SKU to SKU. In addition to increasing the CPU core voltage, we slightly increase the VCC in voltage to 2.2 volt. That's going to make it easier on the VCC IN VRM. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set ASUS Multicore Enhancement to Enabled Remove All Limits. Set CPU Core Ratio to Bi Core Usage. Enter the Bi Core Usage submenu. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 1 to 49. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 1 to 16. Leave the Bi Core Usage submenu. Set DRAM Frequency to DDR5-6600. Enter the AVX Related Controls submenu. Set AVX2, AVX512, and TML ratio offset to per core ratio limit to user specify. Set AVX2, AVX512, and TML ratio offset to 2. Leave the AVX related controls submenu. Enter the DRAM timing control submenu. Enter the memory presets submenu. Select load Hynix 6800 1.4 volt 8x16GB single rank. Select yes. Leave the memory presets submenu. Leave the DRAM timing control submenu. Set vCore 1.8 volt into manual mode. Set CPU core voltage override to 2.2. Set global core isvid voltage to manual mode. Set CPU core voltage override to 1.215. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and check the performance increase compared to the default operation. Running the Xeon W5 3435X at 4.9 GHz across the board represents an increase of 200 to 1200 megahertz across the various scenarios. So naturally we expect significant performance gains in single threaded and multi-threaded workloads. We get a maximum performance improvement of plus 40.55% in 3 mark CPU profile 16 threads. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4690 megahertz with 1.216 volts. The average CPU temperature is 95 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 26.8 and 35.2 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 609.2 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4742 MHz with 1.216 volts. The average CPU temperature is 82 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 27.2 and 33.8 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 498.5 watts. In our final overclocking strategy, we pursue a modern dynamic overclock. In order to do that, we first have to discuss how overclocking on Intel CPUs works. So we have to discuss the Intel overclocking toolkit. I described the history of Intel's overclocking toolkit in another video on this channel titled Alder Lake Non-K Overclocking, How Is It Possible? The long story short is that Intel has developed a overclocking toolkit, which they call the OC Mailbox, which contains all the available tools for overclocking a specific CPU. Not all Intel CPUs have the same tools in their toolkit. As for some architectures, we need different tools than for other architectures. On Sapphire Rapids, the overclocking toolkit consists of the following tools. Notably missing from the OC toolbox are prominent features we know from mainstream desktop, like advanced voltage offset, better known as the VF points, and overclocking thermal velocity boost or OCTVB. As I demonstrated in my first Sapphire Rapids CPU overclocking guide, setting up a dynamic overclock with these CPUs is not that straightforward. And that's for two main reasons. First, as I highlighted in OC strategy number two, strangely enough, 
every core inside this Xeon W5-3435X has a factor of used voltage frequency point up to 47X, despite all but four cores being limited to 45X. Furthermore, the fused voltage for these cores is exceptionally high, 1.37 volt. The unfortunate consequence of this situation is that there's simply no way to use per core adaptive voltage for any cores with this high factory fused voltage. That's because a, the voltage is unreasonably high for any all-core loads, and b, due to the adaptive voltage rules, we cannot configure a lower voltage. Second, even if we could set an adaptive voltage, the integrated voltage regulator has difficulty dealing with rapid transient loads at higher dynamic voltages. For this OC strategy, I use a combination of per-core ratio limit, per-core voltage, and turbo boost 2.0 custom ratio configuration. I set a per core override voltage ranging from 1.215 volt for most cores to 1.25 volts for a few cores. I increased the maximum per core ratio for each core with the additional voltage headroom. The maximum CPU ratio ranges from 48x for core 8 to 52x for core 2. Furthermore, I was able to increase the all core frequency to 5 gigahertz. That means we are now 1.3 GHz higher than the stock all-core frequency. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set ASUS Multi-Core Enhancement to enable to remove all limits. Set CPU Core Ratio to Bi-Core Usage. Enter the Bi-Core Usage submenu. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 1 to 52. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 1 to 12. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 2 to 51. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 2 to 14. Set Turbo Ratio Limit 3 to 50. Set Turbo Ratio Cores 3 to 16. Leave the Buy Core Usage submenu. Enter the specific core submenu. Set Core 0 specific ratio limit to 51. Set Core 1, 3, 5, 10, 12, and 15 specific ratio limit to 50. Set Core 2 specific ratio limit to 52. Set Core 4, 6, 7, 9, 11, 13, and 14 specific ratio limit to 49. Set core 8 specific ratio limit to 48. For all cores, set core specific voltage to manual mode. Set CPU core 0, 2, and 12 voltage overrides to 1.25. Set CPU core 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, 14, and 15 voltage override to 1.215. Leave the specific core submenu. Set DRAM frequency to DDR5 6600. Enter the AVX related controls submenu. Set AVX2, AVX512, and TML ratio offset to per core ratio limit to user specify. Set AVX2, AVX512, and TML ratio offset to 2. Leave the AVX related controls submenu. Enter the DRAM timing controls submenu. Enter the memory presets submenu. Select load Hynix 6800 1.4 volt 8x16 GB single rank. Select Yes. Leave the Memory Presets submenu. Leave the DRAM Timing Control submenu. Set Max CPU Cache Ratio to 27. Set vCore 1.8V into Manual Mode. Set CPU Core Voltage Override to 2.3. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. While it's not as easy to configure a dynamic overclock on Sapphire Rapids compared to its mainstream desktop counterparts, we see the usual improvements from a fixed static overclock. Across the board, we get about 3% better performance with our dynamic overclock. We get the highest performance improvement of plus 43.02% in Y-Cruncher. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX2 enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4737 MHz with 1.223 volts. The average CPU temperature is 97 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 27.8 and 36.4 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 602.3 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 4837 MHz with 1.223 volts. The average CPU temperature is 79 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 27.3 and 36.7 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 496.6 watts. All right, let's wrap this up. As I mentioned in my very first Sapphire Rapids CPU overclocking guide, 
I love the fact that Intel has given us eight overclockable Sapphire Rapids CPUs. When I heard that there would be, once again, overclockable Xeons, I thought maybe there will be one SKU, but no, there's eight. Of those eight CPUs, there are four with the monolithic design and there's four with the multi-tile design. The CPU that I've overclocked in this guide, the Xeon W5-3435X, is my first multi-tile CPU that I overclock. And while I would like to say that the overclocking experience between a Sapphire Rapids with a monolithic die and a Sapphire Rapids with a multi-tile design is vastly different, I can't really say that. The overclocking experience is pretty similar, apart from one or two minor differences. And I think that speaks to the maturity of the Intel CPU overclocking team or Intel CPU overclocking program internally that the overclocking toolkits and the overclocking knobs translate so well one packaging uh, design to another, right? They can apply it in a monolithic CPU design as well as a multi-tile design and it just, it works for, I would say, 95% of the time. Anyway, that's it for this guide. I think I will still try a couple more Sapphire Rapids CPUs in future videos for anyone who's interested in that. Uh, apart from that, I would like to thank you for watching this video and I would like to thank the patrons for, this, uh, for their support. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the comment section below. I'll also put up a written version of this video on my blog if you wanna read through all my settings and results. And that's it, see you next time.